we're going to be discussing intellectual property, in particular, the different types of IP and how that fits within your business so you can protect certain aspects of your business and certain assets of your business. So you'll walk away from here better understanding what intellectual property is and isn't and how it can protect your business. And this is part two. Part two, we're going to be discussing patents, trade secrets, and contracts. And contracts in particular, uh, if you were to Google what is intellectual property, you're probably not going to see contracts in the list. I kind of disagree with that because I think contracts do permit us to create an intellectual property in certain instances. And so that's what we're going to talk about and how you can use contracts in certain scenarios where nothing else will work. Um, with that said, before I begin, I do need to let you know I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Uh, New Mexico SBDC is not a law firm and they cannot give legal advice. So you really need to view the material that I present here is general information and advice, not legal advice. And that's really important because a lot of the things that I say uh, could take up, uh, the things I talk about could take up an encyclopedia. And there's a lot of nuances and you know, minor rules and issues, and I don't have time to talk about all of that. So I'm going to be talking about the general issues and concepts that in general work, but they're not always going to be the, uh, correct in certain circumstances. So uh, if you are interested in any of this stuff, I would strongly encourage you to talk to an attorney or somebody that knows these issues and can guide you appropriately. You know, with that said, let's get started. We're on part two, and so, but I, I wanna do a quick refresher. I don't know if you've seen the first part or not. I'm gonna assume you have, but I do wanna, it's been a few days, and so I wanna remind you what we discussed. And what we started with was what is the, what is an idea? Uh, you know, what is intellectual property? And I have two sort of competing quotes on the screen here. You know, one was from uh, the late and great Robin Williams, uh, basically, no matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world. You know, that's sort of the optimistic view of what an idea is. And then I kind of have the pessimistic view of an idea, and that is they're like elbows. Everybody has one. And, you know, some ideas can be great ideas. A lot of ideas are just, you know, you know everybody needs an elbow, so it's useful, but uh, it's not really the magic panacea was not able to figure out who the author, original author to that was, but I think it's, you know, it's a good quote. And the, the reason I bring that up is, is, you know, the concept of an idea is what a lot of small business owners sort of hang their hat on. And I brought up in the first part, these three companies. And I tried to mention or kind of discuss what the common themes are of these three companies. And the, the answer isn't a great idea, I don't think. Um, it's a lot of things that come together to make a great company. And the kind of the, the five things I mentioned here, you know, our brand, the contracts they have with themselves, you know, their employees, their contractors, their partners, their customers, excuse me, their customers. They also have certain secrets, trade secrets. Um, they have unique work product that they produce. For example, you know, Google has their software that does their searching and indexing algorithms and Apple has their, you know, user interfaces and, you know, they both have their own stores and they have inventions. So those are the intellectual capital of the company and they have lots of them. You know, do they have one specific great idea that catapulted them to the top? I don't know. Google is a search company. They weren't the first search company and they're not gonna be the last and then they're not the only. So it's not search that was, you know, their great idea. Maybe, maybe they have a certain ranking algorithm that's a great idea, maybe. Um, Apple, you know, what is their great idea? I don't know. I think they're a computer company and they, they do certain things really well. And there are other computer companies, as we all know. And then, of course, FedEx. Maybe FedEx's great idea was um, shipping everything to a centralized location and then sending it, you know, from that centralized location. If I'm remembering correctly, that was a thesis 
like a master's thesis, if I'm remembering, maybe a PhD thesis. I should have looked it up. Uh, we can all do that easily enough. But uh, I believe they received a very low grade on it. And so they went and started a company, which ended up being a you know, Fortune 500 company. Anywho, the point is, you know, if you got a great idea, that's wonderful. That does not in of itself make a great company. What makes a great company are these other pieces and aspects that we often overlook as a business owner. And so that is what, you know, you know, the idea concept, I'm trying to push you away from that. You know, I'm trying to push you on thinking about the other aspects and assets of your business. So that implies or that relates to what can be protected. And I have that listed here on this slide. Specifically, we have the top four, which are your typical intellectual property things, you know, trademarks, copyrights, which we discussed in part one. And now we're going to talk about patents and trade secrets. And what's nice about these four are, they are actual things in law that you can enforce against the rest of the world. You don't need to have a relationship with somebody to prevent them from copying your material, your, your copyrighted works. Uh, likewise, you don't need to have a relationship with somebody to prevent them from using your trade secret information. Um, now contrast that to contracts. And contracts, it's not something you can enforce against the rest of the world. And I'll go into more detail on this, but you can certainly enforce it against third parties that are that have a privity of contract. And I'll explain what that means in a few minutes. So in this part two, we're gonna now jump into patents, trade secrets, and contracts, and how that helps you protect your intellectual property assets of your company. So let's first discuss patents. Now, I, I think everybody's heard of a patent. Um, what's interesting about patents is they're pretty hard to get, and they're really hard to keep, and they're expensive. And so a lot of people like to focus on patents, but I think it's important to understand what they are and how they apply. So with that, we have the definition of a patent here and what it does. It's a, it's a legal device that will protect a unique, novel, and non-obvious invention. So what is a non-obvious invention? Well, you gotta look to the experts. And so let's say you have a, a, a new gasoline engine well, what would be not obvious to car manufacturers and engineers in the auto industry? That's what we'd look at. So it's a pretty darn high, high bar to, you know, um, to surpass. There are three types of patents. And the first one is what most people are used to or think about. And that's what's called the utility patent. And if you are awarded a utility patent, you will have 20 years of protection, and I'll explain what kind of protection in a minute. But there are two other types of patents that um, are available, although they're very, they're, they're much rare and they're more specialized. One is a design patent. And a design patent is an ornamental or aesthetic thing that is attached to some sort of device usually or some sort of material. It cannot be functional. It's just a cool looking design that people happen to like, or you think you wanna protect and prevent other people from using. If you get a design patent, there's 14 year protection on that. Uh, most people don't go with design patents, except in interesting um, areas, most people go with copyrights, uh, although they're very different animals here. Finally, there's another type of patent called a plant patent. And yes, it applies to plants. Um, you know, and they it specifically asexually reproducible plants. And now we're talking about, you know, genetic material and very esoteric type stuff that I would, I would doubt most people here would be interested in. However, um, there have been recent changes in New Mexico law that I really can't get into on this particular um, session, but there are, you know, people that might be producing certain types of you know, plants that they might be interested in this. Uh, but we are not going to cover that in today's uh, discussion. So sorry about that if anybody was hoping I'd do that. Um, there are five categories of utility patents. And let's focus on that because that's really what is 
the big issue here for most people. It's going to be a utility patent if you are trying to protect an invention of yours. Those categories fall in what I've listed here, a process, a machine, a manufacturer, a composition of matter, or an improvement to an existing idea. Those are the general categories, and some inventions might overlap in multiple categories. For example, think software. That could be a process or a machine, or maybe an improvement over an existing idea. The uh, patents, when you are awarded a patent, gives you the right, and I put try to, and I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but a patent gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale or importing into the United States an invention for the length of term of the patent in 20 years is what I had mentioned for utility patents. So the reason the government, the federal government is willing to permit you to exclude others from doing this is because you have to disclose the details of your invention to the public. So let's, I'm gonna come up with a crazy invention, teleportation. Nobody knows how to do that. So therefore, I think that would be something you could probably patent. But when you do that, you're telling the rest of the world how to do it. And you really got to think about that for a minute, right? So you get a US-based patent. That's going to be valuable for 20 years. But guess what? You know, do you have a, you know, can you enforce the US patent in Russia? No. Can you enforce it in North Korea? No. Do you know Japan? No, you have to go and then do other mechanisms to try and enforce your patent in other countries. And surprise, surprise, other countries have their own ways of doing things which may or may not necessarily work. So that is really a big factor that a lot of people I think overlook when they're thinking about inventions. And I also want you to think about that when we start talking about trade secrets. And you know that we'll, we'll use that example in a minute. So. The, the other issue you need to understand is, you know, if you have an invention that is, you know, a great thing over the prior art, what is the prior art? Is the prior art other inventions that are subject to patents? So it's possible for you to patent something that utilizes a previous patent, but you are then restricted from using your patent because of the other patent without the other patent holders permission or approval, which you can't guarantee you, you're going to get. So there's a lot, you know, a lot of domino pieces to this puzzle. And as you can imagine, it could get quite expensive and I'll discuss that in a minute. So uh, the, the other benefit here is patents are a right or an interest that may be sold, licensed or transferred. And that ends up being what happens, and we have a lot of engineering clients, you know, they're from Sandia or they're Los Alamos engineers or scientists, and they come up with some really interesting thing. And um, what they'll end up doing is getting the patent and licensing that patent to somebody else or selling it. And that's where there's actually a lot of money to be made um, in doing the patent, creating the patent, and then selling that or transferring it to somebody else that has better financial means to be able to uh, protect it um, or enforce it or license it out to manufacturers or whatever. Um, so, so here's the thing about why I put try to exclude others from making it. The only way you can exclude people is by enforcing it in a court of law. And when you file a lawsuit, that's an expensive thing. You have to pay you know, a lawyer or retainer, usually it's going to be in the $10,000 range or more. And then if they want to fight you, meaning the other side, the opposing side wants to fight you, that could be a very expensive proposition. And, you know, they're going to, you're going to have to call expert witnesses. You know, they're not just going to rely on your word. You're going to have to bring in other experts on why this is over the prior art. They're going to try and invalidate your patent and totally make it worthless. And so it's a real you know, drag out fight, which is why a lot of engineers license it, like I had mentioned earlier, because they don't have the financial wherewithal to spend potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting this stuff in court. And if you don't have the ability and wherewithal to pay the right lawyers and expert witnesses to help you, you could lose your patent rights entirely. So you could, you, you have to be able to go the full mile to be able to uh, fight and litigate properly to defend your patent rights. 
So let's talk about how to obtain a patent if you're interested in that. The first suggestion I would recommend is consider what's called a provisional patent. It's, it's really not a patent at all. All it, it, it really is, is it establishes a filing date. It says, okay, today is the filing date because I filed my provisional patent. And a filing date is really important because let's say you have two different inventors inventing the same thing. Who gets the patent? The answer is whoever files first. The filing date is absolutely critical. So a provisional patent is very inexpensive and allows you to get a filing date. And it also, you know, you don't have to get into a lot of specifics about your invention. I have a teleportation system or a device and, you know, it kind of looks like this. I'll get my provisional patent. I'll get my filing date. Now, once I do that, I have a year to perfect it. And what perfection means is filing my actual utility patents on the invention. And a provisional patent could be made up of one or more utility patents. And I'll be able to use my earlier filing date in case some other joker out there says they were working on teleportation as well. So once you file that provisional patent, and again, it's optional. You don't have to do the provisional patent, but I'd strongly encourage you to do that. Once you do that, then you need to do what's called a prior art search. And it's crazy. I mean, I'm talking about like four inches thick of material sometimes, patents, um, you know, manufacturing documents, uh, chemical documents, depending on the type of invention you have. And it's not for the faint of heart. And you, you really need in a, a really good expert, somebody that knows what they're doing to do that, number one, and then two, to review it and determine whether any of that prior art applies to your invention, number one, and then two, is your invention non-obvious over that prior art? Not an easy thing to figure out sometimes. But let's say you get through your prior art search, you have to evaluate that prior art in light of your invention and figure out what the patentable claims are. So if let's say I, you know, I, let's say we're talking about glasses that have, um, you know, augmented reality. So displays images and overlays those. I'm sure there's a couple of patent on those, but I'm not going, the prior art, yeah, I have glasses here, so I'm not going to be able to claim the glasses themselves, just the augmented, augmented reality components of those glasses. And finally, I would create and file one or more patents based on my invention. And I got to tell you, the process is, is expensive and time consuming. Um, six grand at the absolute minimum. In there, you're probably dealing with a patent mill, paralegals versus lawyers. And so they're not going to do a great job for you, in my opinion. Um, you know, the better, the, the better lawyers, you want a lawyer that you know, ideally has a background in your particular invention. You know, for me, I'm an electrical engineer uh, and a computer scientist. So I would be really good if you had a software patent or, you know, some sort of electrical invention. And I'm going to be a terrible lawyer if you are dealing with like chemicals or chemical engineering or aerospace, uh, you know, you know, weapons, things of that nature. So you want to find just not the right lawyer, but you want to find, you know, a, a, or a good lawyer, you want to find a good lawyer who has the technical training and background that is the subject matter of your invention. So the final thing I want to mention in after you go through all of this, most patents end up being invalidated in court with infringement actions. So while inventions, uh, patents can be very valuable you know, a lot of people end up spending a lot of money and fighting and telling the rest of the world, right? Because we got to make public what our invention is only then to find that their patent is ultimately invalidated because, you know, a judge says it's not unique and non-obvious non over the prior art. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to, I mean, I, it sounds like I'm really you know, putting down patents. I mean, I kind of am for the normal person. You know, if you're an engineer or scientist with some great inventions, by all means, patents, is a, patents are a great way to protect those things. Otherwise, it feels to me like you're throwing money at something that might ultimately not bear any fruit for you. So let's then talk about trade secrets. 
So let's go with, you know, the teleportation device again. You know, I have to weigh, do I want to make, you know, does that 20 years matter a lot to me? Number one, how much can I get accomplished within those 20 years? And, you know, the rest of the world is going to know how to do this. So a trade secret lasts for as long as it's a secret. If I can keep my teleportation device secret for 100 years, I could benefit from that for 100 years, assuming I should live so long. And guess what? The Russians and the Japanese and the Chinese won't know how that device is built if I'm able to protect it and keep it a secret. So trade secrets, I always tell people, are really a great option for inventions that are truly unique and non-obvious. And a lot of times the inventors I talk to say, well, you know, they could probably figure it out. Well, then I, you just argued against it being non-obvious. So is it non-obvious or not? And if it's not non-obvious, then you're going to be throwing your money away, I think, trying to go after the patent. Anyway, so what is a trade secret? Well, a trade secret is information. Information. That simple. Um, it could be a formula, a pattern, a recipe, some software, a device, a process, a method, how you do things. That's what a trade secret is. But that's not enough. Not only is it information, you need more. It has to be economically valuable, important to your business. Even if you can't put a dollar figure on it, it still needs to be valuable to the business. It also has to not be generally known, right? Otherwise, it's not a secret. It cannot be readily ascertained by proper means. What is proper means? Well, let's say you were publicly displaying something and it's just obvious from looking at it how it works. Well, that is not a secret. So proper means would be me just simply watching or visualizing what it is you're doing. Improper means would be not proper, right? It'd be something maybe illegal, maybe involving theft or deception or fraud. That would be an improper means. And, you know, if somebody stole your secrets and made them public through improper means, you still have your trade secret. Well, against the wrongdoer, you lose your trade secret after that. That's a whole other issue. Um, but finally, you have to use reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy of the trade secret. You can't just say randomly, it's a trade secret and not you know, not try to keep it secret. You have to be able to show and prove we've been trying to keep it a secret in order for us to enforce a trade secret. So let me give you some examples of real world trade secrets that are probably important to you in your business. Recipes and formulas. Uh, do you, you know, produce scented candles that rely on, you know, a unique recipe? Are you an e-cig a uh, company that gives fluids to e-cig users. Those recipes, those fluids could be potentially uh, something that could be considered trade secret. Uh, company processes and workflows. I mean, you have your own way of handling stuff, whether it's, you know, testing or fulfillment or sales or marketing or whatever it is, those can be considered secret if they're important and invaluable to your business. Um, but the real value in the real area that trade secrets seems to apply to most people are the following. Vendor partner lists, mailing lists, customer lists. This is where I see time and time again, whether you're a spa, a salon, a um, dog groomer, a baker, you know, a landscaper, you care about your customer lists and what you don't want to have happen is somebody close to you, an employee, a um, contractor stealing that information. So let's talk about how you obtain a trade secret. No registration. If you, you have sensitive information, boom, you have a trade secret. It's that easy. It costs zero. There's no filing fees. There's no nothing. You have it simply by the fact you have 
information that's economically valuable, that's secret, and that can't be figured out by a reasonable means or a proper means. You just have it. Um, you need to treat it though as an actual secret. And if you're not doing that, you can lose your trade secret status. What's great about trade secrets is it gives you the ability to go after not just the thief, i.e. an ex-employee or contractor, but it gives you the ability to go after those who are using the trade secret information. So for instance, the new employer of the ex-employee. And I can't tell you how often this happens. I've had, I don't know, four dozen clients in the past couple of years where they had an employee that they trained, they used, they made the materials, whatever it was, and then they literally go across the street and open up a new candle store or a new e-cig fluid company. And guess what? Using the same flavors or colors or scents and whatever it is. Um, I've also had issues with a lot of issues with employees leaving and stealing the customer list. And I see this a lot in the spa and salon and waxing industry. It's ridiculous. So you'll have, you know, some employee come in and work, you know, three, six months and think every employee that they worked on is their customer, not the, their employer's customer. And then when they leave, they don't take just the customer list of the people that they worked on. They take the customer list of the entire company and then they go and send out new flyers. I've had it so bad. Um, I can't tell you names. I'm sorry, but we had an issue and it wasn't involving a spa or salon, it was involving um, a cheerleading thing. Um, and one of the coaches literally left the organization and stole the customer list and then sent out to everybody, we've moved. <laughs> so they didn't just steal the customer list. They tried to steal the business. They named the business the same. They tried to do everything and just say, we move, come over here. Outrageous. Um, but it, it costs money to fight that. And so we had to, to do that. It was ridiculous. So what I want to mention here is it's really important to maintain the secrecy of this stuff. So how do you maintain the secrecy of your customer list? Well, I think you're already doing it, right? You're not making your customer list publicly available. Just because you might have a couple of customers listed on your website or you know, giving you a favorable review on Google or Facebook or something isn't publicly making your customer list available. Um, but you need to maintain reasonable efforts to keep it secrecy. And you know, what does that mean? Well, keep it locked up or behind a password. Don't let everybody have access to the customer list. Maybe it should be on an, a need to know basis, for example. Um, you wanna, you know, if you have recipes, put it in a locked filing cabinet. You know, why would you have receptionists, for example, um, or janitors or somebody that, that would be looking at recipes, right? They shouldn't have access to that information. Um, important information, it would be good if you can put confidential and trade secret, do not distribute, label it, put that on the top of your, your file, of your filing cabinet. If, you, if it's an electronic document, put it on the footer next to the page numbers, for instance, put it on every page. Um, almost like I have, you see page 15 for us down on the bottom right. If I really cared about this, I'd put confidential and trade secret, do not distribute on the left side of this footer. So it would show up on every page. That's what I would do for an internal presentation, for example, and you should do the same thing. You need to also train your folks a little bit on how to use and maintain the secrecy. This should be something that you do regularly. And if people are going to abuse or not lock things up and put things away, you need to write them up. You need to make sure that it's something you're enforcing and you're trying to protect. Um, finally, you know, it's funny when I, I you know, I've been a lawyer almost 30 years. Uh, I told you I'm an electrical engineer. I know intellectual property very well. And I told you about a couple of examples of already of trade secret problems with my clients. And when I go and threaten the other side, sure enough, they lawyer up and I 
I can't tell you, like nine times out of 10, they hire a lawyer that has no understanding about trade secrets whatsoever. And nine times out of 10, those lawyers tell me, well, there's no contract it says it's a trade secret, so it's not a trade secret. And, you know, it's like, okay, this is going to be one of those. Because when I got to debate a moronic statement like that, it costs my client time and money as well. And, you know, they're going to want to fight over this and it's ridiculous. They shouldn't fight. They shouldn't do what they're not supposed to do. And they shouldn't be using stolen information. But at any rate, a contract is not required. A contract just helps. It helps to show that we're asking people to treat this as confidential and trade secret information. You don't have to have a contract with everybody that has trade secret information in it, but it's helpful. So if you have that ability to put a contract in place for your employees or contractors or others that are gonna have access to your trade secret information, then please do so. Now, there is one exception to that. If you're gonna be, you wanna use the federal trade secret law, then yes, you do have to have a contract in place. The, the trade secret law at the federal level requires that. But if you're dealing with local folks here in New Mexico, New Mexico trade secret law is, is the bazooka that I need to go after people. So you don't really need to worry about the federal stuff unless you're dealing with somebody in another state like California, Texas, Illinois, and you're relying on California law or some other law that may not have the same issues with trade secret law that New Mexico does. So finally, I want to try and get you to think strategically about trade secret information. It's extremely valuable. And you may be thinking, ah, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I don't care if people steal my customers. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, are you sure you don't care? And would you care later down the road? If so, just try and treat it as a secret for now. And I want you to do one better. On the customer lists, the vendor lists, the, 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 the things of information that uh, databases that are important to your business, I want you to consider putting decoys in that database. So for example, if it's a customer list, um, you know, it's gonna have contact information, email addresses, right? Phone numbers, addresses. Put in some decoys that, you know, it's not obvious it's you, but you know, you set up a fake email somewhere or, you know, you use your, uh, you know, family member or something like that. And that way, if your list is stolen and the decoy receives a marketing announcement or notice from somebody, you have instant evidence of the theft, right? Because nobody should know about this, these decoys without stealing and using the list without your permission. So that's a wonderful thing to do and think about if you have mailing lists and database type information. So please do that. Um, but I want to just remind you before I, I end on trade secrets and move on to contracts, just because somebody's doing something similar to you doesn't necessarily they, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they stole your trade secret information. If you are doing something and you have your own recipe for a wonderful apple pie, that doesn't prevent the rest of the world from trying to come up with their own wonderful apple pie as well. You need something more than just simply, hey, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. And so it is a bit of an evidence problem, isn't it? We have to show, you know, you, you had access and you stole it through improper means somehow. And, and now as a result, you know, and then the, you know, the time sequence works out. You didn't have that wonderful apple pie until you hired our employee and now you have that wonderful apple pie. So now we have some causality here. We have some way to possibly argue it was a theft of our recipe. And now that's why you have our apple pie. So that's enough on trade secrets. I spent a lot of time on it. And I really like trade secrets because, you know, let's go back to the teleportation device I came up with. Um, the uh, teleportation device, nobody knows how to build something like that. So if I try to go and patent that thing, you know, it's a US based patent. I can only enforce it in the United States until I try to expand out to other countries, but I can't, I'm, not, I'm never gonna be able to expand out to all countries, but trade secrets, 
Nobody knows how the teleportation device works. They're not going to be able to figure it out just because they look at a, you know, black box. So trade secrets provide a lot of benefit for inventions, processes, other magic stuff that you have in your business. And so I really encourage you to look more into that. And, you know, even if you don't think you need it, you have it. So try and treat things secretly if you can. And then maybe down the road, it might be valuable to you for some reason. So the final thing I want to talk about is contracts. And I know we all know um, what a contract is. And by the way, uh, thank you for the comment. You, um, they like the idea about decoys, decoys in the database. Um, it is a thing that has been very valuable to us. And what I tell people is, if you make things easier for the lawyers, interpret that to mean less expensive, right? If you make my job harder, I charge for my time, it's going to cost you more. So you know, doing decoys in a database is wonderful, it makes my job a lot easier and we love that. So let me talk about contracts briefly. I know you know what a contract is, but what I wanna remind you is contracts are more than just like, you know, locking a deal in place. They are a bargain for exchange in value between two parties. And what does that mean? If you wanna be called Daffy Duck, well, I wouldn't recommend that. I, I would imagine Warner Brothers would probably have a problem with that. If you want to be called, you know, queen or king, emperor or empress, you can if enforce that if the other party is willing to sign a contract to that. So what it allows you to do is, you know, if you have to get other people involved in your business, other people I have to learn about your idea, you can create intellectual property. You can just by getting two people to agree to it. And similarly, you can prevent them from taking that information, even though you can't otherwise enforce it in a contract, uh, I'm sorry, in a patent or a trademark or a copyright. You can still tell people, hey, you can't copy this. You know, And when the contract's over with, you gotta delete everything and send it back to me. So contracts are still a form of intellectual property and they're very flexible. You, you know, you have the standard, you know, what, you know, we call wet signatures with your employees, contractors, people that you see face to face and interact with. But there's other ways to incorporate this into what you do. For instance, on your websites, you can have a terms of service listed at the bottom of your footer that goes to a specific terms of service page and tells people, hey, guys, we view this as our intellectual property and we retain the rights to all of this and you agree not to challenge and copy and so on. So you can put that in your terms of service without having people to have to sign. Now, if you're gonna be collecting money, um, if you're gonna be putting a lot of requirements on people, you probably wanna switch to what's called a click wrap. And a click wrap is, as you may know already, you've seen this with different types of products online. If you're going through the purchase process, you can't continue without clicking on a checkbox saying, yes, I agree to the terms and conditions of this sale or of this website or whatever it is. That's considered a click wrap. And it allows you to stuff a lot of stuff, a lot of things in there that would help you protect your ideas and your valuable intellectual property assets of your company. Finally, um, there's what's called a shrink wrap. And you see this a lot in the old days, when you go to like an Office Max or computer store and buy an actual box co containing software, you have to literally crack open the seal and that seal says you agree to their terms and conditions, otherwise you can't use the product. It's now turning into a little bit of a, a click wrap because you buy stuff online a lot now, but a shrink wrap is still a possibility. You you'd basically incorporate that into your package or your design somehow. So all of these are available to you when you're interacting with people. You're basically creating a bunch of one-on-one -on -one relationships between your company and the customer, your company and the employee. And you can incorporate terms of service or contract language into those relationships and help protect your intellectual property in ways that you would not otherwise have available to you. You know, contracts can 
you know, maintain accountability and establish duties and obligations. They can ensure payment as well as uh, penalties for non-compliance or breach, or they fail to do something like notify you if they know somebody's taking advantage or using your product or service without your permission. You can terminate relationships with contract and establish how to do that. You really important here, limit warranties and limit indemnities and liabilities. And there's one thing I really want you to understand as a business owner. In New Mexico, look up um, unfair trade practices. It's a UTPA claim we called in the legal world or Unfair Trade Practices Act. Consumers can use this against merchants and businesses. And it basically requires some sort of allegation of wrongdoing on the business's part, but the bar threshold is really low. So what would be a, an example of wrongdoing? Um, misrepresenting. You told me you're gonna give me a fast website and my website's slow. You misrepresented what you sold me. I gave you a bunch of money to build me a website and I got a slow website. Well, what is fast and what is slow? Who the hell knows? Let's go to the judge and argue it. And oh, by the way, if you lose as a business, you could be subject to three times damages and attorney's fees. So you don't want a UTPA claim against you if you can avoid it. Um, you gotta put stuff in the contract. You limit the warranties, limit the liability. So let's say you had a UTPA claim. I would, in the, you know, if you had a contract, hopefully there's a limitation of liability clause that says, look, you're not responsible for any fees, penalties, judgments, interest, whatever, above and beyond what you've been paid. So that'll help you limit or cap uh, in contract what a UTPA claim might otherwise argue, you know, three times damages plus attorney's fees. So it's really important to have those clauses in an agreement with your customers or clients. Uh, but there's other things contract can do, do for you as well. Control how to, you know, how disputes are resolved. You know, can they just go and file a lawsuit right away because they have an uncle who's a lawyer or do they got to go through mediation or do they got to try and work with you first? Um, and this can really help eliminate or reduce expensive lawsuits. Um, other clauses to consider would be confidentiality, non-compete, non-solicitation, and then the trade secret language I mentioned earlier. Now, you may have read about uh, non-competition in that it's not enforceable. That's not true. Now, in certain states, it might be not true, like California, but let's say you have a customer in California. Does that mean you can't enforce your non-compete? Well, if they agree to a contract based on New Mexico law and your contract says they got to come and sue you here, it can be enforced, even though they're located in California. Lots of fun stuff with all of that. What you need to be aware though is contracts cannot be enforced against third parties who are not a party to the contract. So that's the, the, the big limitation here with contracts and why those other four areas of intellectual property are so important. Copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. So if you can use one of those four with some of your stuff in business, you certainly want to do that. But when you don't have any one of those four available, or even if you do, it's good to also have that stuff in a contract against the people you're doing business with. Now, I want to warn you, there's a bit of an exception here, and that's called tortious interference of contractual relations. What the heck is that? Well, if I know you have a contract with an employee, and I go and I hire that employee away and breaches your employment contract, and it causes you harm and damage, you have a cause of action against me, even though I don't have a relationship with you at all. That would be tortious interference of contractual relations. Now you can't enforce the employee contract against me, but you can certainly come after me for the damages associated with your employee's breach of the contract. And an employee contract isn't a great example. A better example would be a customer of yours. If I know you have a client or customer contract and I purposely go and convince that individual to breach your contract. Now, now there's some issues with that, right? If I just have a better price and the customer on their own free will decides to go and terminate 
their services with you, well, then there's probably not a lot you can do. But if you can show that I knew about the contract and I purposely manipulated events to get the customer to terminate the contract with you, then yes, you might have a tortious interference, a contractual relation claim against me. The other thing you need to be aware of is contracts cannot be overridden by verbal promises. And let me give you an example here because it's so important and it just, it just angers me to no end. I love when Larry the lawyer purchases something and then the sales guy or gal on the other side of the table pushes a contract over to me and then starts telling me what's in the contract. I'm like, look, you just, you know, no offense, please shut the hell up for five minutes and let me read this thing because the words out of that person's mouth are absolutely meaningless. They, they don't mean a thing. And we've had instances where the person saying things had actually lied and been wrong about what was in the contract they were trying to get somebody to sign. So you don't want to rely on verbal promises, oral statements at all when you have a written document. And you need to be aware of that when you have the contract as well as when you're signing contracts with somebody else. Finally, you need to be aware that contracts cannot be perpetual. If you have, you know, you say in perpetuity. Now, when I, well, I say that, we lawyers do use the word in perpetuity, but we don't use it as a term to control the length of a contract. What we will do is some trickery. We'll say the contract is for one year and it automatically renews every year unless a party issues notice within 30 days, for example. So what that's called is an evergreen clause. It's a one-year contract. I can create a three-year contract. I can even create a 99-year contract in certain circumstances, like a land lease you may have uh, heard about. But um, it can't be perpetual. Otherwise, it's automatically void. So be careful about that. Finally, I'm just gonna quickly run through some other popular and useful clauses because we're talking about contracts. Confidentiality, always, you know, don't, don't let people just talk about the deal with your business or pricing or anything like that. Confidentiality is a great clause and it's great to have people return materials if the contract's terminated. Employees, contractors, vendors, partners, non-competition. Now, what you need to know for individuals for employment, it has to be reasonably tailored in time and geographic scope. If you have 10 years for a hamburger flipper in the entire state of New Mexico, that's probably not going to work. Uh, if you had 10 years for a very highly specialized PhD scientist in neurology, that might work. So it kind of depends on the sophistication of the individual and what they do and, and a couple of other factors. So don't be, don't be overwhelming with this. And if you have, you know, like low wage, low skilled workers, you're going to you have a really hard time with that. So, you know, it's just the higher, you know, um, more skilled workers that that's going to work on. And then I've seen stuff apply from anywhere from about three to 10 radius miles within a city to statewide, depending on certain types of jobs or positions. And then usually two to five years, three years being the average is, is kind of what we see and we think could be pretty enforceable, at least in New Mexico. Non-solicitation, there's no limitations on this, but what is non-solicitation? If I'm gonna hire you to help me with my company, I don't want you soliciting my customers, my employees, my partners, my vendors. You need to keep your hands off of them because you wouldn't have known about them except from coming to me. That's what non-solicitation is. And there's no limits on that. That's a really good clause to be thinking about in contracts. We talked about trade secrets and it, it's necessary if you need to take care of the federal level for trade secrets. Uh, finally, I talked a little bit about limitation on liability. You really need that, you know, especially if you're a business and you're dealing with consumers because they have that unfair trade practices act possible claim against you if they want to beat you over the head with a billy club. Uh, limited warranty is always really good. And the problem with warranties is there are certain implied warranties, uh, merchantability, non-infringement, uh, fitness for a particular use are three that just pop 
into my head immediately. There's a few others. And um, you want to document your actual warranty. And I had a cement uh, surfacer company and they had a warranty saying if there's any defects in the materials or workmanship, we'll go and redo the floor for you. That was their warranty. Seems straightforward and easy enough, right? Until they ended up doing a very expensive home in Santa Fe with a doctor who had a custom home with a faulty foundation and the foundation was cracking and his, you know, his, you know, millimeter of epoxy on a cement isn't enough to stop the fundamental forces of mother nature from shifting that foundation. And sure enough, it kept cracking after the seventh time of redoing that floor. They finally called me saying, well, what can, what can we do? And the answer is, well, we can throw up a bunch of mud and make it more expensive to, to go after you, but you need to change your warranty in the following ways. And so we were able to get the problem resolved after they spent, oh, I don't know, $8,000 in legal fees. Um, but consider that. It's, it's, it's important for in ways you may not even fully realize or appreciate. Finally, um, well, not finally, also I want you to think about indemnities. And what an indemnity is, is a reimbursement for any harm or damage you incur associated with their breach or their mistake. And, you know, if somebody's going to go and, you know, take your stuff or if they're going to create problems for your business, you should get paid for that. That's what an indemnity is. Finally, dispute resolution. What that means is, is if you're going to fight about things, you're going to go to court, you better be serious. And number one and two, you better win. Otherwise, you need to pay me for my fees and expenses associated with defending myself. Um, the reason we kicked off contracts in the first place was because of intellectual property. We can define it in the contract. And then we can also th say things like, you agree not to copy my stuff. You agree not to challenge my ownership and right in my, my crazy idea. You agree to accept all of this as is unconditionally. We can put that kind of stuff in the contract. The other thing is a right of first refusal. I always want you to think about that, especially in relationships with vendors and partners. Why? Well, let's say you have an important vendor that provides cleaning supplies. They're local. You think they do a great job. Well, what happens if they sell someday? Maybe those cleaning supplies aren't available to you anymore. So throw in a right of first refusal saying, hey, if you're ever gonna sell your business, give me a right of first refusal. I want the ability to buy the business from you before you sell it. Now, not everybody's gonna do that, but if you get a few people to do that that are very critical or key to your business, who knows? Maybe in a few years, you might end up owning some of the suppliers and you have yourself a really nice integrated business with a lot of different pieces, but it may be something you'll never use, but it might be nice to have the option someday. Um, acceptable use. Who can use what, what's permissible, what's not, you know, depending on the type of business. If you're in the hosting business or you're providing access to technology, maybe you want to say they need to keep their passwords up to date. If they believe their account is being hacked, they need to tell you right away so you can shut things down. I mean, what would be important to you that would go in an acceptable use piece. Uh, and then finally, finally, I think that's the last one, I'm forgetting all the, the list, is notice requirements. You know, if something important happens, the other side should have uh, some notice responsibilities. They should tell you, you know, if they're going to sell, if they're not going to be able to deliver, um, you know, what is important to your business to help you reduce your risks and your costs associated with a change in circumstance. You can put those in notice requirements. Oh, there was one more. I forgot. Insurance requirements. Do you want people to be insured for some reason? You know, if are they walking on your premises? Are they doing things that are critical to your business? Um, are they going to be handling your assets? Maybe they should be insured so that if there's a problem, a theft, a fire, destruction, somebody gets hurt, that their insurance will pay for it, not you or your business.